Welcome, ladies. If you are returning as a Seacoast Grace Ladies Bible Study joiner, then welcome back. If you are joining us for the first time, we are so glad you're here, and we hope that you get plugged in and dig deeper into God's Word, as well as connect with some other ladies in your small groups. So our study, I can't get no satisfaction. All right, so when you saw that or, or read it, did you hear Mick Jagger's voice in your head singing it? Because no, j just me? Okay. All right, maybe it's just me. So how true are these words? I can't get no satisfaction. How many times in your life have you thought, oh, that person, that thing, that job, that paycheck, uh, whatever, that event, it would make you happy if I just get to that point. And maybe for a time it did, but eventually the shininess of whatever that thing or that person or that event, whatever it was, it starts to wear off. And I think about times in my life when I've been particularly stressed or just maybe dissatisfied, just unhappy. And it's usually because there was something that I thought that, that I wanted or I was looking to the next thing. I find myself doing it with seasons in my life as well. Once I get past this busy season at work, I'll be able to really enjoy my life. Once I get past this project, once I get past this, oh, life's going to be good. And I realize that I'm kind of wasting the time that I have here instead of living in the moment. So we are rarely satisfied and content, I think. And what is it that we're going after? What are we investing our time and our resources in? And why are we not satisfied? And that's what we're going to be looking at together over the next four weeks, along with discussing ways around that. How can we choose to be satisfied? What are things that we can do? Because sometimes it's easy to say that, oh, just be happy. It's not always easy just to flip that switch. And so we're going to talk through what I hope will be some practical things starting uh, with this session. And as we go through the book of Ecclesiastes over the next four weeks, I don't know about you, but I've often thought Ecclesiastes is kind of a strange book. It's, it's often thought that Solomon wrote it, although we are learning that it's likely someone else, and we may not even know who that is because they think now it might have been written after Solomon's time. Maybe they were using Solomon as a sort of model of the character. So the way that it's written as you're going through, and today I'm going to be going through just a, a few key sections and reading some. I encourage you to dig deeper. We're going to be going through the first three chapters. And you'll notice that it talks about an author introducing himself, and then the author is introducing the teacher. So it's as though the author is introducing a character called the teacher, and it's the teacher who is speaking. So that's just a, a little bit of background. And so as we dig into this book over the next four weeks, I hope that as always, you look at it from the perspective of what is God trying to say to me throughout this time? And you're going to have discussion questions with your group that also help you dig a little deeper into that. What can we learn from Ecclesiastes about being satisfied? So I'm going to take it in sections in case you're reading along. And the beauty of the video is you may at points want to pause the video and read that section and then continue on however you want to do that. So chapter one, we'll start with verses one through 11. <laughs> this book starts out with this super inspiring verse. Meaningless, meaningless, utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. <laughs> Yes, it's going to be a great book, right? It starts with that. So we could read that and think, okay, well, then what's the point of anything? What, what, am I, what am I doing? What am I doing here? But there's more to it than this. And, and first of all, the word that was translated from Hebrew into meaningless probably doesn't mean what we think it means. And, and that, I think, can help with this as well. So the original word in the Hebrew was hevel. H-E-V-E-L. And hevel means breath or vapor or smoke. And if you think about it, think about when you see smoke or vapor or even kind of like the wind. It's kind of mysterious and, and smoke comes and it curls and you don't know where it's going. And then all of a sudden, whoop, it's just gone. Think about it like that. And it's, it's also a way to describe life as fleeting or temporary. The same word hevel was also used in some other places in the Bible. For example, Psalm 39, 5, it says, you have made my days a mere hand breadth. So like the width of a hand, not very long. The span of my years is as nothing before you. Each man's life is but a breath, hevel. 
Also in Proverbs 31:30 at the end, it says, charm is deceptive and beauty is fleeting, hevel. So it's not just pointless, it's fleeting, it's mysterious, it comes and it goes, we don't know how long we have. So the examples and pictures that are here in Ecclesiastes, they're of things on earth. And that's one thing to keep in mind as we are listening to the teacher over the next few weeks. This person's perspective is an earthly one. And this tells us that it's coming from a human earthly perspective. And that is much different than God's perspective of things. We don't see things the way that he does. In verses three through eight, the teacher goes on to tell us about the futility of life here. Hey, the earth is a hard place. We work, we exist. No matter what goes on in our life, whether things are good or bad, guess what? The world goes on with or without us. It says that the wind continues to do what it's going to do. The sun rises, the sun sets, streams and rivers flow into the ocean. The ocean never completely overflows. And yet this was all created by a God who has always been and always will be, and who's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So in verse nine, the author says, there's nothing new here. And I think if you, if we really stop and think about it, that's true. I know in recent times, there is a tendency for a lot of us to say, gosh, these are crazy times. Nothing like this has ever happened. Well, maybe not in our lifetime. Guess what? Things like this, and maybe even crazier happened before. So while it's new to us, it's, it's not new to God, and it's probably not new here on the earth. And once we're gone, how long do you think we'll be remembered? And I know that maybe is a bit of a depressing thought, but think about it for a moment. How long do you think, once I'm gone, will I be remembered one generation, two generations? I doubt it. I mean, unless we've had a huge historical impact in some way or, or form, it probably won't even go that far. So how important is the short time that we have here on earth? And really, once we're gone, are we gonna care? Because we're not even gonna know. So what are we doing to fill the time that we are here for this brief vapor, hevel? <laughs> what are we doing during that time? If you were part of our study when we talked about the book of Job, you may remember that we talked about our life here being so short, like teeny tiny in light of miles of eternity. That's kind of the analogy there. And how incredibly small and insignificant our life here on earth is in comparison to what we're going to experience in heaven. That brings us to our first point. Our first discussion point is our life here on earth can only be satisfying when we live it with a heavenly purpose. I think these verses in Ecclesiastes are reminders of this. Our life here on earth doesn't just end so that we can do whatever we want and then eventually enjoy heaven. Heaven is going to be so much better and greater than anything that we can experience here, but we should be living our lives here in light of that. It's not, hey, here's my life and I'm just going to get through it until God takes me and then I'm going to enjoy heaven. Heaven is an extension of our life here. We should be living here as though we're preparing and getting practiced up and ready for heaven and look at it as one long thing, not an end and then something new. So what are we doing here that has an eternal impact? And on a, on a much smaller scale, I, I was thinking about people that I've worked with and I've been at my company for about 30 years. And in that time, I've met so many people and I've worked with people who eventually retired and many of them, some, I knew of people that worked 25, 30, 40 years and then retired. And every so often I would hear stories about shortly after someone passing away from various causes. And you think, oh my gosh, they worked all that time and they finally got to retire and hopefully enjoy life. And then, and then they're gone. And it, it was kind of an eye opener. It makes you wonder. I know most of us have to work. I know I do. We need to support our families. We have bills to pay. And yet, are we so focused on work and to what end? Why are we focused on work? Is it just to get more stuff? Is it to seem important? So I think sometimes it's more a matter of looking at why are we working? Why are we doing that? And have we lost sight 
of what our true purpose is. Now that moves us into uh, next section, which is still chapter one, verse 12, through chapter two, verse 26. And he talks about wisdom. And at this time, wisdom was a big deal. It was a sign of status. People wanted to be thought of as being important. And a lot of that had to do with how much wisdom do you have that you can impart to others. And think of Solomon and how he was known as being the wisest man who ever lived. So there was a great deal of importance placed on this. And the teacher in this story, he's trying to find purpose. He's already talked about how Gosh, life is just a fleeting vapor. What's the point? And so he's trying to find some sort of contentment. And so he now goes to wisdom and decides, you know what? This is it. This is what's going to get me total satisfaction with my life. I'm going to study every book. I'm going to learn things. And I'm going to gather all of this wisdom. And then he realizes hmm, all that wisdom just came to nothing. In fact, in chapter 1, verse 18, he says, For with much wisdom comes much sorrow. The more knowledge, the more grief. So it's almost like, huh, the more you know, the more depressing everything is. So great, what's the point of that? So then he thought, okay, well, clearly wisdom is not the ticket. So you know what? I'm going to go after pleasures. And so if you look in uh, chapter 2, verse 10, he talks about how he denied himself nothing. Anything that he wanted, he just went after. And apparently he had the resources to, to do that. He, he tried laughter, drinking. He built a lot of houses. It says he planted vineyards, which in our world might be kind of like taking on new business ventures. And he also acquired great wealth in the form of things like, well, at that time, slaves, flocks, silver, gold, oh, and singers and women. Everything you could think of that somebody could do that they might think would make them happy, the teacher, he just, he just did it all. And so he had pretty much anything that most people would think is a sign of success and, and happiness. He didn't say no to anything. And voila, he's happy, right? Yeah, so in verse 11, he says, Yet when I surveyed all that my hands had done and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless. A chasing after the wind, nothing was gained under the sun. All of that and still hevel. So he's tried wisdom, he's tried all of these pleasures, and he's just hitting a wall every time and realizing, what? what what's it going to take? You know, I was, I was reading a commentary on this book, and they brought up something that I hadn't really considered, which is our time here, the way that we live, especially, I think, here in, in the West, is much different than then. And that wasn't the surprising thing, but one perspective they brought is how differently we look at royalty. Because in our world today, while we have kings and queens, it's, it's not the same. Back then, there was a huge distinction between kings and queens and the everyday person, a huge gap. And so while kings and queens got to live how they wanted and had a lot of wealth, the everyday folks were, were basically just living hard lives with no hope with no anticipation of anything better. It's just, this is the way life is. I'm going to work hard and then I'm going to die. And that's pretty much it. I think for us, it's different because we don't have that huge gap, which in many ways is great. I think that we are, we should be thankful. On the other hand, I think we're also just inundated with technology, with commercials, with a society that's telling us, oh, you need to have this. If you buy that car, if you do that thing, if you buy that house, if you live in that neighborhood, if your kids go to this school, then you're going to have it made. That's what you want to go for. That's the goal. And so while there's nothing wrong with treating ourselves to, to nice things, in fact, a little bit later, I'm going to talk about the importance of celebrations. And, and heck, I like a good pedicure just like the next girl. But I think what we need to look at is why are we pursuing these things? Even wisdom, sometimes wisdom for wisdom's sake can also be something that takes us off track. Why are we pursuing an education? It's, is it for status? Is it to get that good job? Or is it really seeking more knowledge? So the teacher in verse 16 says, for the wise man, like the fool, will not be long remembered. In days to come, both will be forgotten. Like the fool, the wise man too must die. So along with the pleasures, now he's kind of back to wisdom. All of these things basically end the same way. 
So he goes on in the rest of chapter two to talk about how much he hated his life. Super inspiring again. He found no purpose, no enjoyment in anything. He knows he'll work and he'll earn all of these things only to die and leave them to someone else who didn't work for them and who probably won't see them as important as he did. So what should we do? Well, here's our second discussion point. Take time to recognize God's purpose in the everyday ordinary things. And I think this can be so simple and it's, sometimes it's just a matter of taking time. Uh, it's those things that remind us of what's really important. <laughs> For me, not having kids and, and having a dog, in fact, I've had dogs most of my life, and the one that I have now is uh, over 13 years old, so I know my, my time with him is limited. In fact, I, I'm gonna say one of my uh, life mottos is, everyone should have a dog. Okay, I, I know there are allergies, I know there are other things, but I'm, that's just what I'm saying, that's what I'm saying. So another reason why I use dogs, not that they're on the same level as people. I do see though how God has really used my dog to teach me how to slow down and to see things I would never have seen before. Uh, for example, my dog loves to go on walks and there's a park very near my house where I can just don't have to drive anywhere. We can just put the leash on and go and go walk. And I will tell you there are some days work is done and my dog, I swear they have internal clocks. He knows, ooh, it's time for walk. And he starts coming up and headbutting me. Come on, let's go, we gotta go. And there are days after a long day at work, I just think the last thing I wanna do is go walk. I just wanna pop in front of the TV and just do nothing. And yet in those times when I do it, I am so glad that I did. First of all, it's good for me, but also some side benefits. I've met people, God has put people in my path, both Christians, and non-Christians who I would never have met if it weren't for being out walking my dog. And when I'm having a crazy day at work, like many of you, maybe I'm working from home, which typically I like, it also means that I'm stuck in my office and generally I don't get out to do anything until I kind of see my dog out my back window and realize, ooh. And then I go out there and he get, when he gets all wound up and he wants to get a tug rope, again, because he's older, I know there's gonna come a day when I would give anything to have that back. And so when he goes and grabs a tug rope, I'll take two or three minutes. I'm trying to learn to stop and play tug rope with him for two or three minutes. Something that simple gets my mind out of that work mode. It gets out of the rat race mode. And it reminds me to take joy. He is so stinking happy just to have me hold on the other end of that rope. So at the end of my life, am I gonna be remembered for my amazing tug rope skills? No, I don't, I don't think so. And uh, there's, there's nothing glamorous or exciting about holding the end of a slobbery, tattered tug rope. And yet I feel like those are moments when God's saying, you know what, this is where you need to be right now. Just take a moment, stop and do that. Your ordinary thing may be very different. Maybe it's just stopping and folding laundry, just finding some peace and just folding laundry. I don't have to think, I can just be and be thankful that I have laundry to fold. Maybe it's doing homework with your kids. I don't know, maybe that's more stressful. <laughs> so whatever it is, take time out. It doesn't have to be a long time. It might just be a, a few minutes. So when our life is done, all that we've worked for, all we've learned, all we've done in our careers won't matter as much as the time we've spent enjoying those everyday things and the people or the dogs uh, in our lives. That now brings us to the next section. Now we're in chapter three of Ecclesiastes. Whether you are new to the Bible or you have been studying it for a long time, you probably will recognize these verses. It's a section that most people would know even if they haven't studied the Bible. Maybe they don't even realize it's from the Bible. In fact, uh, I think back in the 60s, there was a, a song about it. And uh, I, I won't read all of them, but in the first eight verses, the just it starts out, there's a time for everything and a season for every activity under heaven, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, a time to uproot, a time to kill, a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build. And the teacher goes on and lists several other things in those verses, contrasting things, a time for all of those. And in verse 11, he says something that kind of seems different in character to what we've heard so far, which is he, meaning God, 
has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the hearts of men, yet they cannot fathom what God has done from beginning to end. And I think maybe that at our core is also a reason why we're not content. In a way, here on earth, we're not supposed to be because God has set eternity on our hearts. We're supposed to be looking to heaven. That is the end goal. That's what we want. But this whole thing about time, I am a lover of routine. I am a checklist person. I like having a checklist. I like having a plan. I like checking those things off and knowing what's ahead and mapping things out. And in many ways, that can be a good thing. I suppose it makes me efficient and and dependable. It also makes me cranky when something gets thrown into my plans and they they don't go as I had planned. Like I'm getting ready to get something done and my dog comes and bugs me to play tug rope. Oh, I don't have time right now. So it can go the other way, I think. And I'm still learning, even after all these years, that it's okay to plan things, but that doesn't mean that things are gonna go the way that I plan them or even that they should. And sometimes my plans need to get put aside to do something more important, something that maybe God has in mind that may initially not even seem like anything huge or purposeful. Sometimes God, though, has a way of of sneaking those things in and and giving us a, a different purpose. And you know what? When those things happen, whether I get cranky or not, guess what? I always have time to get the things done that I really need to get done. And maybe that's not you. Maybe you're one of those fly by the seat of your pants kind of people. Maybe you're one of those people that a couple hours before you're getting ready to leave for the airport on vacation, you're packing. That would stress me out. And I kind of envy that at the same time, if you're, if you're that kind of person. But if you like planning things out to the point sometimes that I do, then here's a, an application point that will hopefully be helpful for you. Don't be so set in your plan that you miss God's plan. He may have something else. The first eight verses that I, I touched on are dedicated to allotting time for everything, even things that are not so pleasant. That's just, that's part of life. And so the, the teacher, the author, both discovered there's a time for all of these things. And then maybe we need to realize that there's a time to get all the things that we need to get done as well. And sometimes God is just trying to get our attention. So the next time you have that plan or that to-do list and a monkey wrench gets thrown in it, stop for a moment before you get cranky like I, like I would and, and ask yourself, wait, is there something else going on here? Is there a reason? Is there something that God's trying to wake me up to and, and point out to me? So we move to the last section of chapter three now of verses 12 through 22. And I'm going to focus for right now just on verses 12 through 14. And it says, I know there is nothing better for men than to be happy and to do good while they live, that everyone may eat and drink and find satisfaction in all his toil. This is the gift of God. I know that everything God does will endure forever. Nothing can be added to it and nothing taken from it. God does it so that men will revere him. So I grew up uh, in a Southern Baptist church. In fact, I was there through my mid-20s from the time that my parents got married and had me. We always went to a Southern Baptist church until I came to to Seacoast about 29 years ago. And I didn't really think about it at the time, but since then, I've heard other people's perception of Southern Baptists is we're, we're kind of known as being the big killjoys. And I guess in some ways there were some strict things. Uh, For example, there was a reputation that we weren't allowed to go to school dances. Well, my my parents let me go to school dances. It didn't help my dance moves at all, by the way. And they did, though. There was no drinking. It it was ultimately pretty conservative. In fact, I remember spending summers in Oklahoma with my grandparents on their farm. And my grandma also went to a Southern Baptist church. And I would go sometimes with that small church's youth group to their summer camp. And it was it was pretty strict because you're in Oklahoma in like July. And if you're not familiar with that, it's, it's like 100 degrees, 90 percent humidity. And the girls had to wear long sleeve shirts and these long skirts. And it was super hot. So we were known for kind of being the the denomination that wasn't allowed to do much of anything. And it, most of it was not 
true. I had a, a great childhood and I never felt like I was being deprived of anything. I think though that that reputation is one that Christianity as a whole sometimes has. How many uh, non-believers have you talked to who hesitate? And there are often many reasons why someone may hesitate to come to Christ. One among many reasons that I hear is, yeah, but gosh, if I, if I join up with y'all, then I'm going to have to give up this and this. I just, you know what? I'm just not really ready to give all that up. You, you know, if I feel like God's just telling me what I can't do, he's just saying, no, don't do this. No, don't do that. And the funny thing is, that's not at all what God intended. In fact, if you look at these verses that the teacher says, he's made everything beautiful. He set eternity in our hearts and he's made earth here for us to enjoy it. So that brings us to our, our last discussion point. Our time on earth is to be enjoyed, not just endured. We're not just here biding our time until God takes us. And yeah, life can be hard. There will be hard times. There are going to be days when we have to get out of bed and do things that we're not super excited about. And there's going to, there are going to be times where we get some bad news that we don't want to hear. There will also be times when we have to exercise self-discipline because God set certain things where he said, you know what, there's a reason that I want you to follow me and follow my word. I want you to be happy. That's the whole that's the whole thing is to be in fellowship with him. So we have to choose to see our time here in light of God's purpose. And we have to choose and take time to enjoy those things. And sometimes we just might have to look a little harder for them than at, at other times. So we were uh, talking about uh, celebrations and, and Autumn actually brought up a point in one of our meetings, how God back in the Old Testament in all of the laws about the don't do this, don't do that, guess what? There were also a lot of do's in terms of do celebrate this Passover, for example. There were times when God said, this time is set aside for you to celebrate, to party, basically. And I know I've seen that in my family. We have always celebrated. Birthdays are a big deal. When it's your birthday, that day is about you. You get a dinner. You get to have whatever you want. You get gifts. Christmas, we, we celebrate that. And recently I got engaged, and so now I'm in part of another family and I get to see how they do celebrations and it's very similar, which is awesome. So now I just basically double up on my celebrations. And so we need to find those times, find the things to celebrate, find the things that God has given us to have a purpose with him and to enjoy life in the midst of that. So this week, as you meet with your small group, and I hope you do, if any of you are watching this and, and you haven't signed up, or maybe you're on the fence, maybe you haven't joined a small group yet, and you're thinking, I don't know, I don't even know any of the women, I don't know, I'm going to encourage you, do it. it. It will be a good experience for you. I think you're going to enjoy it, because while you can learn through this teaching time where the deep learning will be and where you really find out more about God and his character is when you connect with other women and you all talk it through together and share your stories and, and talk about what you've learned. So if you're on the fence about it, get in there, join that group, whether it's in person or on Zoom and connect with some other ladies. And I hope you all are having a wonderful week. Hope to see you all soon.